Hey guys, <laughs> welcome for the Liberty Me Bookworm Hangout on Wednesday night. It's good to see you guys again, Frank, David. How's it going? Good, gentlemen. Good. <laughs> so how was the week? How was the week, Frank? You said it was exhausting. Yeah, it's pretty exhausting, and I didn't even uh, have time to to come home and take off my tie. I had to stay in my tie right up until the moment we went on air with this beautiful program. Wow. <laughs> um, why do you wear a tie during the day? Well, I've thought long and hard about this, David, and I've come to the conclusion that um, you know a tie is like a man's uniform. You know, it's like the business uniform. Uh-uh. And it seems like in our culture we like to have uniforms. And so there's something culturally uh, significant about having the correct uniform on. But, so, but correct me if I'm wrong, Frank, part of your job involves going to people's institutions and telling them what they're doing wrong, right? So you require a certain authority to get through the day. Yes, that is true, and I think the tie helps me with that. E even though I do live in Austin, and most of the people that I even work with uh, do not wear a tie. And if you were familiar with Austin, Texas, you would understand why that is. Uh, but I buck, I buck that trend and, and think the tie actually helps me do my job properly. Now, now, when you see people who are untied, do you judge them differently? Um... Well, obviously, they don't have the status that I have. That's just, you know. <laughs> so I just, I know that, but I don't, you know, hold it against them or anything. Uh, <laughs> no, but it's more about, it is uh, just more about presenting a professional appearance and whatever it is, the tie signifies. So other people don't, but, you know, that's just the way it goes. Yeah. You know, I've been thinking... Uh... I've got to start. I've got to start doing some some tying myself for uh, for various things. I mean, I don't, I don't spend much of my time telling people what they're doing wrong, but uh, nonetheless, I kind of feel. I mean, especially after Frank's soliloquy on the importance of ties as the manly uniform, I feel kind of <laughs> naked. Here. Well, you know what the other interesting thing about it is, you can get into just about anywhere wearing a tie. Like nobody questions a guy walking into <laughs> some place with a tie on. They just think, well, obviously he needs to be here. You know, he, I mean, he went he went through the trouble to wear a tie. Yeah, well, actually, obviously. That's why, I, that's why I let you into the hangout tonight, Frank. I just <laughs> he was supposed to be here, right? He must be on the guest list. <laughs> yeah, he wouldn't. He's not just some riff raff off the street. He's wearing a tie, for God's sake. <laughs> so you can you can get into some surprising places, and people won't think twice about it just by wearing the right uniform. Yeah. Now, now, I mean, you don't feel bad about trading on these symbols? <laughs> oh, okay. Now we're getting into the ethics of neckties. Well, I figured Tyler was going to ask this question in a minute, so... The ethical implications of neckties. Well, just of trading no. on the whole... It's an interesting thought. <laughs> it's an interesting thought, but these things exist regardless of if I u utilize them or not. It's not like I could, uh, if I deemed them as inappropriate, I could vanquish them at will. Yeah, but you're perpetuating the stereotype of the man of authority in Thai here. I mean, you're part of the problem, <laughs> Frank. Frankly, Why is I that problem intended? The only way I'd be more offended is if you're wearing a badge. Like that's the only that's the, the way in which a uniform can be used to abuse other people. So just you be know, knowledgeable about that and don't act like the boss all the time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, Tyler actually, it's it's hard for Tyler. To he actually has to make himself wear a shirt because he feels bad about fulfilling that. Uh, you know, playing on that symbol, trading on those symbols, as David says. Yeah, well, why don't we just walk around naked? I mean, what do we need all this clothing for? It's just a I mean, social construct, know. man. <laughs> yeah, it's just a social that's construct. It. We're, naked we're, hangouts. We're, that's it. We're, <laughs> we're, 
Whoa. <laughs> this is totally not that kind of show. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I, I would say, I would say you know, David, you probably wear pants to work, <laughs> and you know, I would assume we don't really know about each other. Do you mean as as opposed to shorts, <laughs> or uh, as opposed to shorts, or as opposed to nothing at all? Oh, yeah. So, so aren't you trading on these social conventions as well? Well, I mean, I think it's pretty functional, you know. It's uh, just better for <coughs> keeping the, the furniture clean for me to be wearing something. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I thought you were going to say because of the pockets. Ah, yeah. It's well, all about it, the it, pockets, it, man. It is. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, I think I've seen David just walking around with a sporan and nothing else. <laughs> <laughs> I am... Um, I actually do often show up to work uh, in biking shorts and a biking shirt and then, like, have a towel and walk around for the first hour of my day like that until oh, that's I've awesome. cooled off. Yeah, yeah, that's great. Until I've cooled off and then I actually get into some clothes that I might want to talk to other people in and go from there. But you um, can carry out fit in down here in Austin. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I, I, I like Austin. I've I've been only once, but I, I was definitely favorably impressed. <laughs> I've only been to Texas once oh, I was a kid. I was a teenager, and I was um, on the coast, Corpus Christi, uh, Rockport, that kind of thing. So I never I never touched Austin itself, but I got some of the craziest hitchhiking rides of my life in, uh, in Texas. My first hitchhiking ride ever in Texas, I waited at a gas station uh, trying, to, trying to pick up a ride. And finally, you know, I kept, people keep showing up, and I kind of, you know, mention casually that I'm looking for a ride without looking like I'm begging. <laughs> And, you know, but sometimes a really tough guy comes in, you know, and I'm thinking, you know, I'm not going to ask this guy for a ride. I'll just let him go. Well, one of these guys shows up with, like, a giant mullet. He's got ripped jeans and everything, and his car looked pretty gnarly. And uh, so I thought, I'm going to leave this guy alone. But he turns to me, and he says, hey, are you looking for a ride? And so, <laughs> <laughs> and so yeah. and by the time, you know, I, the, it was a done deal. I agreed to the ride. By the time I got to his car and found out that it only had one front seat, the, the, there were posts where the other front seat should be, but I had to sit in the back seat, and he could just kind of lean across to talk to me between taking swigs from his king can. Wow. But you survived. I, I survived. You know, that's my only Texas experience, so I imagine that's what daily life is like for you, Frank. <laughs> Those characters. Well, yes, of, of course. That's that's all I ever do, Mike. <laughs> <laughs> Go to gas stations and get rides from. I mean, what 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 decade was this happening in? Uh, <laughs> I guess it's the nineties. Really? You were hitching rides in the nineties, with all we knew about hitchhiking <laughs> and the dangers thereof. <laughs> that, all seemed, that all seemed quite innocuous. <laughs> I don't know. What? Yeah, no, I, I don't hitchhike. <laughs> sorry, to, uh, sorry to break the news to you. And I don't think I don't think hitchhikers like guys in ties, anyways. You know, that's a good point. I don't know if well, except for ministers, those are the only kinds of guys in ties that pick you up, like a clergyman of some sort. If the clergyman has a tie, the then you might pick oh. up. Other than that, guys with ties don't pick you up. Yeah, well, and also guys who are driving won't pick up a guy in a tie. So if I'm out there like this, yeah, if I'm out there like this, I'm not going to have a lot of luck. I don't know, man. Maybe you're trying to sell insurance. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah, it doesn't really fit the, the stereotype, you know? Like, you see, like, guy in a T-shirt and some jeans on the side of the road. You know, he's just having a good time, right? You understand. That's what he's doing on the road. He's just going to see his mom or his hippie girlfriend or whatever. But if you see, like, Frank and his tie on the side of the road, it doesn't. It doesn't fit in, you know. Trading on the symbols all of a sudden turns against you. That's true. Hunter S. Thompson and his lawyer would never have picked up Frank as they were driving, <laughs> as they were driving through Las Vegas, right? Which probably would have been good. Yeah, they, good for Frank, but <laughs> that is one of my that is one of my favorite Hunter S. Thompson scenes. When they pick up the hitchhiker, and then they they're on like a combination of mescaline and some other uh, mescaline and an alcohol. And <laughs> they, they just proceed to 
totally freak out this guy who was uh, ostensibly just looking for a ride. <laughs> <laughs> and they stopped him from running the first time, and then he got away the second. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and then they got all paranoid that he was going to become a narc. <laughs> that's right. That's right. That's right. Yeah, see, if he'd been wearing a tie, they would have known he was a narc right away and just kept on driving. Or a Mormon. <laughs> or a Mormon. <laughs> yeah, see, so it's all about the uh, context. Yeah. The, the context of the tie. Yeah, that's true. If I see two guys with ties, I usually cross to the other side of the street because I think they're... Evangelists. Huh. <laughs> Are they carrying a book in briefcase? Like that's the thing. If it's just a book. Yeah. You know, I actually I, I have people that that come to my house, the my house upstate, pretty frequently. Like maybe once a month, they they show up and they want to talk about the Bible and they're, you know, trying to sort of make a conversion and the rest of it. And I'm always I always engage them. You know, I always talk to mm-hmm. them. Like, my girlfriend says that I shouldn't. I shouldn't encourage them. We want to keep them away. But I think I think talking to people about this about this sort of stuff is actually really useful because you get to see how people think about it. <laughs> so you uh, like use libertarianism on them when they're trying to convert you to Christianity? Mm, I would say I'm more using uh, Platonism on them, and they're trying <laughs> to convert me to Christianity. I mean, I'm definitely of the you know sort of. Let's let's look at religion from the point of view of uh, of a system uh, a system of thinking and uh, certain kinds of cultural exchange. And they're talking to me about uh, an allegory of the truth. So it's a very I mean, there's a way in which the conversations can never actually meet, but but it is very very interesting. So I de- I, I definitely get something out of it, although I don't think it's what they want me to get out of it. Yeah, I wonder what those guys' conversion rate is. Like it's got to be. You know, if the conversion rate was even one percent, they would be taking over the world by now. Yeah, that must be a very challenging task. Well, it depends what your goal is. If your goal is to spread the word and hope that it it someday finds uh, you know finds root in a in a a believing heart, then the fact that they come and they talk to you and you don't actually show up at their church is is not necessarily a failure. Yeah, yeah, okay. But anyway, we do have to talk about I mean it says bookworm hangout. We have to talk about some <laughs> some books other than the Bible. Um, what are what are people reading? Who's that? Somebody just joined. It looks like it it's the ultimate Tyler. Wow. Hey, sorry about that. I mean, I crapped out. Uh oh. So my little brother, he's just a bandwidth hog. <laughs> um, so we were just we were just That's sort trippy. of broaching that tender subject of what we're reading. Yeah, I I read I've read like three pages in the last week, um, uh, in, in between putting my changing my kids uh, various diapers. And uh, at work, um, I, I have had time to to change out of my work clothes, unlike Frank. But but other than that, I've been I've been trying to read this gigantic fantasy series, Wheel of Time, again. I'm on book ten out of fourteen, and I put it down for almost two months because there were just like recurring plot devices, recurring tropes, and I was getting, you know, I wasn't as excited about it. it was, things were getting kind of predictable, and so I put it down. And I thought, you know, it'll be fresh again in two months. And it might be a telling sign that I that I've started again, but I keep passing out after like a paragraph. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that is a sign. Um, well, I had I actually have been reading, as you know, I've sort of discovered P.G. Woodhouse, or actually finally started reading P.G. Woodhouse after hearing that he was great for for many years, uh, and I'm I'm just sort of steaming my way through the P.G. Woodhouse books, so. So now I'm on stiff upper lip Jeeves, which is just a, it's more, you know, it's kind of more of the same where Jeeves is the, uh, Jeeves is essentially the keeper or nanny of this English gentleman in the, in the 20s. And, uh, you know, it's just, it's, it's really, really funny. I mean, Woodhouse is, is wonderful at, at writing these, 
know-nothing aristocrats who uh, essentially are living off of uh, the family's money or living off... Yeah, basically, it's living off the family's money or living off of the one industrious relative who they all look, <laughs> who they all look down on. That's the thing that I love about it, right? It's, it's like, oh, this person has a job. You know, they're, <laughs> they're so mundane that they actually work, but they're the person that's supporting the livelihoods of all these uh, other people or supporting the lives not because they don't have livelihoods. <laughs> But, but Woodhouse manages never to get pissed off about it. He's always just poking fun at them in all of these ingenious and really fun ways. Um, and, of course, Jeeves is essentially the working man, right? So the working man is the one who is intelligent and engaged and actually interested in things. And uh, it's the people who are the moneyed class who are completely boring and ignorant of most things. So They're fun. I love them. Are the aristocrats just like sitting around playing croquet and uh, having ennui the whole time? Well, yeah, basically that's what they're doing. That or they uh, seeing musicals um, and and eating in restaurants and um, driving uh, to the country for weekends with people who really don't like them very much and aren't very interested in their conversation because their conversation isn't very interesting. Um, <laughs> You know, it's just, it's it, it, it's remarkable. It's really funny. Let me see, I'm going to see if I can find something in here. Hold on one sec. Um, it sounds like kind of a, like a Seinfeld thing, like a comedy about nothing. Yeah, yeah, they are, well, they are kind of, they are kind of comedies about nothing, but I guess what I'm saying is that they really, what they really are about is this, um, this class of indolence within, you know, now, this is, this is Britain, right? So this is a, a I, and this is Britain just just after the empire really is is is, is waning um, after World War One. So it's you know it's it's like uh, it is a critique. It's a satire. I mean uh, of of that whole way of of thinking about um, British superiority, which which at its core was what you you got from the British Empire. So it's not it's not purely about nothing. It's really about that. But but what he actually what actually happens is he just talks about all of these mundane things that these people do. Um, let's see, where is that thing? Oh God, it was so ridiculous. Um, oh, here we go. Okay. So, so he, he's talking. He's at lunch. The, this is Bertie. This is one of the aristocrats, and he's at lunch, and he's talking. He's talking to uh, a, a friend of his who's going, who's been invited to to stay for a month at this house, and uh, Bertie says. Uh, Going to be there long, and then the woman that he's dining with says, "About a month, um, at the same place all the time." And she says, "Of course." She spoke lightly, but I found myself eyeing her with a certain respect. Myself, I've never found a host or hostess who could stick my presence for more than about a week. Indeed, long before that, as a general rule, the conversation at dinner at the dinner table is apt to turn on to the subject of how good the train service to London is. <laughs> The present obviously hoping wistfully, uh, all those present obviously hoping wistfully that Bertram will avail himself of it. Not to mention the timetables left in your room with large, with a large cross against the 235 and the legend, excellent train, highly recommended. <laughs> um, <laughs> <laughs> so you know, I mean, he just he just does that stuff, and it's all it, it's all with that that um, I mean, he never goes straight at a joke or straight at an issue, but he but the way that he comes at the things is always is always funny and, and kind of methodical in its way. So I I think it is about something. It's just not about I mean, it's not just about these indolent people. It's about what that does to them. The fact that they are soulless and that they are vapid is that that's relevant. I know you're saying, how judgmental Solis and Abbott, but they are. They are. <laughs> he doesn't apologize for it. So anyway, I'm reading. I'm reading that. I'm reading reading the chronicle of the Solis and Vapid uh, <laughs> ex empire. Um, and then I am also going back through that book, um, the Seven Pillars, that TSL eight book that I mentioned a, a while back. Um, this is a book that he writes about his. Um, 
his experience during World War One in uh, in what is now Saudi Arabia and then was just uh, was just Arabia, um, and it's amazing. I mean, it is absolutely incredible because it's all the same stuff. I mean, it's, we're we're dealing with exactly the same things now uh, and uh, basically in the same ways. Um, let me see. I had something from that too. You mean uh, imperial occupation and arrogance and colonial resentment? Well, and blow, and blow, and blow back. Yeah, but I mean, it's 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 deeper than that. Um, let me find this this thing. It's just it's like crazy. How David comes prepared with bookmarks. Um, well, I don't actually have the problem. Is if I were really prepared, I would like have a, a quote right there. I have to like go back through the pages. But I just remember reading this and saying, "Oh, this is the thing I should I should bring to the." Let's see. Oh yeah. Okay. Here it is. Um. So so. T. E. Lawrence is talking about. Um, he's talking about. So I mean, his his role was to go was to be the representative of the, of the British. Um, for uh, to the Arabs in there, and then um, convert them as fighters against Turkey, right? Because Turkey enters World War One on the side side of the, of the of the Germans, and and so the British are fighting them, and Lawrence is dispatched along with a, a bunch of other uh, a, a bunch of other Br British army to go and help the Arabs uh, and and to organize them against the Turks, right? Basically, just getting them to fight their war in a place where they can't fight it, um, and. When he's talking about that, hey Cameron. Hey, hey Cameron. <laughs> How's it going? We're we're we're, we're talking about uh, what we're reading, and I just I'm I'm giving a, a little T. E. Lawrence excerpt. Um, and, and so so Lawrence writes this book, The Seven Pillars, where he talks about his experience, um, and uh, and he. At the, at the beginning of the book, you know, he's framing up he's framing up the the situation, and he says. Uh, Let's see. He says, he's talking about, uh, about the, oil, the oil interests. At that point, it's the British Petroleum's oil interests in the Middle East. And he says, I'm afraid of the whole situation. He says, I'm afraid that I hope so. We, we, pay, we pay for these things too much in honor and in, the in, and in innocent lives. I went up the Tigris with 100 Devon territorials, which is uh, just troops, basically. Uh, young, clean, delightful fellows, full of the power of happiness and making women and children glad. By them, one saw vividly how great it was to be their kin and English. And we were casting them by the thousands into the fire to the worst of the deaths, not to win the war, but uh, not to win the war, but the corn and rice and oil of Mesopotamia, uh, but so that the corn and rice and oil of Mesopotamia might be ours. I mean, what is that but the first Gulf War, right? I mean, it was the Iowa farm boys who, like, got into the army, wow. and those were the guys fighting that war. Um, so it's that, I mean, you know, it's that kind of stuff, and this is 100 years ago. It's yeah. 100 years ago this year. Uh, so it's it, it's really awesome. I mean, it's definitely dated, and and he is Lawrence is a weird dude in a lot of ways, but <laughs> but it it has some really fascinating um, relevance to our our current situation and the way we think about things. And he's a wonderful writer. I mean, his his writing is really really interesting. It's not just uh, it, it's not just a, a chronicle. Mm -hmm. what, anyway. what's, his, what's his take on the like you've you've described? his take on the situation as he's thinking about the the British glory and British deaths, or British honor and British deaths, but what's his take on the other side of the situation, the, the occupied population in Arabia? Yeah, yeah. I mean, the, the interesting thing is that he, he has real remorse for his role, because his role is essentially, his role is essentially to use the, the Arabs as this shield against Turkey, and, and he does that very successfully, and, and the he does it with a kind of promise that Britain will somehow back Arab independence. Right. 
and of, of course that never materializes and and he knows that it's not going to materialize but he's still convincing them do he's he convinces himself that it might materialize and certainly if they lose it won't right if <laughs> if if the arabs lose then then it couldn't possibly happen so he convinces himself that it might happen if they win and so he does anything you know possible he does everything possible to win so it's it's it, yeah it's just really really intense in that way a cool book the Seven Pillars. So I can highly recommend it, actually, at this point. Yeah, I'm getting pretty tempted now. What about you, Cameron? What are you reading, man? Uh, a little bit of this, a little bit of that. I've got... Um, I just finished a book by Virgil Store uh, called the, the uh, Understand the Culture of Markets. Oh, cool. uh, he, he works at uh, the Mercatus Center um, at GMU. Really good book, really fascinating. Um, it's not too long either, and uh, it's pretty approachable. I was able to get through it pretty quickly. So I just finished that, I think, last week, and now I've gone on to reading what I have. Zero to One uh, by Peter Thiel. I just started that the other day, and it's it's an interesting read so far. We'll see how that ends up happening. We'll see what ends up happening with that one. Everybody's been touting it. There's a lot of good one-liners. Uh, there's a few things that... I disagree with so far, but it's just definitional stuff, you know, not, things that that are of more interest to, I guess, nerds like us than uh, <laughs> than the, than him who's a practitioner. You know what I mean? So <laughs> that's all it really comes down to. I'm not sure if my I'm not sure if my issues with his does definitions that he uses are um, detrimental to his thesis throughout the book. Right. I haven't finished it yet. So, given that, we'll see. It might just be one of those things that warrants a little bit of attention to say, hey, you know, he's using, I'll say, he's using a, a, an understanding of competition that's not necessarily correct, I'd say. Um, but it's he, sufficient for his story. Yeah, he's saying that competition is bad in a lot of ways, and that, but, it's, but it's, wow. it's not that competition's bad, it's that competition for competition's sake is bad and detrimental. You know, huh. competing to just compete, that's bad. You shouldn't be focusing your energies on destro uh, on destroying your your business competitors and things along those lines, you know. And that, in that sense, that's what, it's a very narrow definition that he's taking, but he's generalizing it out, and he's also trying to use economists speak by trying to bring in perfect competition and the ideal which. But he's you know, really the, describing his own mindset as an entrepreneur rather than an economic, an abstract economic category. Exactly, and that's why it's like you know, it's 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 one thing to kind of be like, well, you're 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 screwing with the ideas here a little bit, but whether or not it's truly de truly truly detrimental to the points that he's trying to make, that's to be remained seen. Because I'm only what sixty pages into a three hundred page book, which is well, it's considered three hundred pages by the iPad standards, so I don't know if that really translates into <laughs> in, in physical things anymore, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But uh, it's interesting, you know. He's got a lot of really good one-liners, and he's got a lot of really good uh, things that kind of open up. And he's got a very interesting perspective, which I really appreciate. And um, like it, it, so far, it's it's good, um, but just some little qualms, of course. But I'm a nerd, so that's why that's why I qualm out on, you know. <laughs> but yeah, that's about what I've got. I've done a bunch of other stuff for school, for grad school stuff that I don't want to bore any of you with. Like, like mostly har mostly harmless econometrics. Nobody needs to hear about that right now. <laughs> huh. yeah. Wow. Is that like econometrics written by Douglas Adams? No, it, it, it's uh, econometrics. It's basically, basically, and this is the exact way uh, that the authors um, kind of put it to the reader. It's the Hitchhiker's Guide to Econometrics. <laughs> Uh, yeah. But what does that mean? What does that mean? It means that uh, for the most part, yeah, I know, right? Uh, for the most part, it's it's a very approachable uh, book, and it uh, it's good for an econometrics textbook, of course. You know, it it actually spells out a lot of the intuition behind the things that you're doing, rather than just being a bunch of mathematical models and things. Watch, those are in there. They go through and they're very careful to make sure that. Uh, that you understand what's truly going on, you know, mm -hmm. is what it comes down to. Sounds like um, they wrote an econometrics economic, economic textbook, and then the publisher said, this will never sell. We need a fancier hook. 
<laughs> no, I don't know. It's, it, it's not tough. He, he actually says, I mean, I, like, maybe I can pull it up real fast. Because, I, of course, me being the anarcho librarian, I can find digital copies of any book ever. I've got a digital <laughs> copy of it somewhere. Well, while you're looking for that, I have one question, which is, is this guy, is the author rich? Because if it, it seems to me that if these people can model their economics so well, then they ought to be really, really wealthy. Right? They ought to be <laughs> like, yeah, market, got it tied up, no problem. Well, well the book on Amazon is $120, so it just depends <laughs> on the weather. So. <laughs> All right. Well, yeah, fair sure. enough. Okay. That's the publishers take out from everything, right? Yeah. Let's see here. No, um, they're, 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 it's Angris and somebody else. I can't remember who the other uh, author of it is. Is the right off the top of my head. Hold on. Um, are they rich? I don't know what their personal bank accounts hold necessarily. Right. Of, of course. I mean, I, I mean, I'm being facetious, but no, but course. there's always there's always that feeling like, well, if these people understand this so well, then how come they can't use it to their own their own benefit? Maybe you know, they just I, choose not to. Like they derive great utility. From explaining economics with rather thin Douglas Adams metaphors. Yeah, <laughs> you are so generous. That's that's like that's just one of these things about your personality, Mike. You're very generous. Right? <laughs> I mean, I I prefer to believe that they just don't know and can't manipulate the market because that's what the market tells us, right? Way too many variables, way too complex. So then these books become really kind of like how you look at this thing that's too hard to understand. You can understand the sort of general forces, but but you, you, could, you couldn't ever get enough information to be able to master the whole system. Oh, definitely. And, you know, I, I take that qualm definitely with uh, econometrics in general because, of course, being, being from the Austrian camp, but I see... I see econometrics as being very useful for of course, for historical research, for historical purposes to kind of give an eye, to paint a certain picture. No model is ever going to be 100% perfect, right. um, but you can use models to kind of show, to, to try and find a way that there's there's some way to weed things out. It's just you can't use econometrics to prove or, or disprove economic theory. And people that kind of take that idea and that stance, that they're kind of getting misguided on it. It's not really that you're trying to prove theory, it's that you're trying to demonstrate at this point in time what was really going on. And if it goes contrary to a correctly reasoned economic theory, then guess what? All else wasn't equal. That's all it comes down to. There's something else that's messing with it that you can highlight and you can show, okay, maybe next time we should be looking out for this, you know, and things along those lines. But it's, I think I see it as being so much of a fetish right now is to just try and use this to refine these tools and everything else. But, you know, where it can be useful, it's overlooked in a lot of ways in, in what the true interpretation of it should be, you know. It, it's and it, a, lot of, a bunch of Austrians have had that uh, thought too. Um, it's, but it, all it comes down to is it's fun, but it doesn't disprove any theory. You know, like there's an old study with Cargman and Cruden Krugman and Card with the minimum wage stuff hmm. that, oh, look at this. At this one point in time in, I think, New Jersey, in this one sector of the market, minimum wage actually increased employment. Right. Well, that's just all else wasn't equal. You know, that's all it comes down to. There are a whole bunch of other things going on. That's right. Krugman. You didn't disprove the theory whatsoever. You just demonstrated at one point in time that the special caveat in the majority of all economic theorizing, all else equal, didn't hold. Good for you. That's what it comes down to. Bravo. You, you right. convinced me that the world doesn't live in a vacuum. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, I think those guys would be a lot more convincing if they were wearing ties. That's know? right. <laughs> like, oh, tie. <laughs> <laughs> what about you, Frank? Uh, now you've got the tie. Like, you hold the authority here. What have you been reading, man? Well, along those same lines, I'm reading What I Learned Losing a Million Dollars. Awesome. Who who wrote that? <laughs> By Jim Paul and Brendan Moynihan. Huh, okay. Do, do you guys know what quarterly is? Quarterly? Yeah, quarterly.co. Yeah. Oh. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's uh it's pretty cool actually. Yeah, so you can you can sign up and get a mystery box every quarter from um. uh, what they call curators. You know, famous people, 
um, that you know that, that that you should you know align yourself with for whatever reason you know you like their music or you you know you're into what you know the things that they do. So my quarterly guy is Tim Ferriss. Tim Ferriss. And, and if you don't know who he is, you should. And so this this quarter he sent one of the things he sent is this book. So I, I look forward to learning all the things I can learn about losing a million dollars. Without actually having to do it yourself. That's a very, very smart strategy. Yeah, because I imagine you have to first have a million dollars mm -hmm. before you can lose it. Indeed. So I don't, I don't think I can qualify for the first part of that. And then you can sue him for a million dollars because you lost it in a way that wasn't mentioned in the book. <laughs> oh yeah, man. Now, then you can lose it his way afterwards. <laughs> and then sue him for something else. <laughs> and that's the sequel. Yeah, I'll just I, I'll just hire Tyler to do all my suing. Yes. <laughs> and he'll get a cut of the proceedings. Yeah, well make sure he wears a tie to those proceedings, man. You can't win Oh yes. without a tie. When you're doing your suings, you need a tie on, that's for sure. <laughs> no one's going to respect you as you try and sue somebody's nuts off unless you're wearing a tie. Yeah, there's a good there's a good suit and tie pun here that's not quite reaching me. <laughs> pretty sure pretty sure what Frank just said it was an old uh, adage my grandpa used to say. Yeah. Your grandpa used to talk about suing people's nuts off? <laughs> what a cool guy. Well, that, that is among other things. I mean, there's lots of different stuff to choose from. I, I'm pretty sure that's what he said. I can't remember. I could be paraphrasing in my mind. You know, who knows? And Tyler, what are you reading, man? Yeah, I knew I was going to be having this, so I uh, went out and got a book. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Like um, it's it's See, midterms we, we week. Your eyes. <laughs> it's, it's midterms week, so I haven't been able to read as much as I want to. So I have a book, and I can tell you about the author because I've read two more of their works. Oh yeah, good. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's just uh, midterms. I got so much stuff in my head that's boring. So, um, anyways, I'm reading right now. Um, and tomorrow's reading day, so we got reading day after midterms, which was really useful because um. So I'm going to read uh, Expatriates um, by uh, James Wesley Rawls. And again, it's um, cons conspiratorial fiction uh, based on a post-economic collapse. So this is the third book he's written, but he doesn't write uh, in a framework that builds a central narrative. It's, it's all its own narrative around the same time. So this is like the third book, and then in a week, next Tuesday actually, he's going to be putting out his fourth book. And I don't know how much he's going to keep focusing on being post-economic, like focusing on like going into a post-economic world and then the dystopia that falls out of that, or if he's just going to write from post-economic, because half the book's really just people getting, re getting ready. And for that reason, I would call it a more survivalist fiction within um, post-economic conspiracy theory. Um, but yeah, it was a really interesting look on um, you know, how people are using liberty-minded ideas to actually write about how um, free market solutions can work in a post-stated uh, society. That sounds really cool. I love um, uh, military fiction for reasons unknown to me. Um, uh, maybe too much playing with GIOs as a kid, and there's something about there's something about the uh, the way the text is done on the cover of this book. I'm looking at it that looks really really uh, stark and uh, masculine, and the guy on the cover has a Looks like a rifle of some kind in his hand. Yeah, he's shooting it off of a sailboat. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm like, sold What battle here. is that? Uh, yeah, I want to see what battle that is. <laughs> um, this is the one coming out on Tuesday. It's called uh, Liberators, and it's like okay, I want. It does, like I said, it, it isn't read in like consecutive order. It, he builds his own narrative for every book, but it still does kind of focus on that post-economic situation. And then you realize, like most of the people who do. Uh, have all these conspiracy mindsets towards post-economic reality would argue that the status institutions would actually have to fight for their own existence and the majority of people who actually don't aren't in those systems would actually have to like take back their own geographic regions. Like I don't need to pay you taxes dude, you aren't doing anything for me. <laughs> My favorite um, picture of kind of post-collapse or post-apocalypse 
that focuses on liberty theme, liberty themes, economic themes, and also uh, rejection of the failed promises of the central government is Jericho. Has anybody seen that series, Jericho? I remember it. I remember it vaguely, but I don't think I saw much of it. Yeah, it's uh, it's like the the first episode. Uh, somebody drops a nuke. I forget on what city, on an American city, and um, the 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 whole story is about the people of this little town, Jericho, who are close enough to see the mushroom cloud, but far enough away to survive. And uh, all the communications go out immediately. So through the series, they have no clear idea what's going on in the rest of the world. They only get glimpses and glimmers, but they do encounter various state agencies uh, and uh, mercenary forces claiming to work for state agencies, and increasingly the townsfolk uh, find themselves rejecting uh, the outsiders regardless of who they claim to represent and and sort of refusing to participate in the central state anymore, kind of like what you're suggesting, Tyler. Uh, yeah, I mean, like I said, all the narratives are different, and I guess, like, Patriots would be the best example of that. Like, I haven't gotten all the way through this one yet. But, um, I mean, I'm sorry, like, to bring, like, conspiratorial fiction in here. I know you guys are talking, like, economics and something a little bit more highbrow as far as literature, but yeah, uh, no. I think there is, a, like, diversity Adams. here. Um, <laughs> but, yeah, I mean, like I said, I like the ideas within fiction that you can create out of conspiracy theories, and um, that one's post-economic. That's really cool. Yeah, I'm pretty tempted by that now. Tyler, is that by the same author who did one the one second after? You know that book? I don't. I don't think so. Let me look that up. So it's Tyler, the same does it matter genre. which book in that series I start with? Like James Wesley no, Rawls. but I mean, it? yeah, it's just James Wesley Rawls, and um, I mean, for me, I would just say go with Patriots because it was probably the one that he spent the most time like creating like very. Uh, intricate like action sequences, so you do have that military fiction aspect of it. Nice. I um, mean, most of his characters are like either in the military or post-military. So um, one second after, the, the way they go actually go um, into explaining how you would survive would still be pretty much outside of like a military survival manual. So it's approachable for that reason because even the vernacular they use, people could understand based off of like uh, military terminology. But that's again the, the book they fuck the most shit up. So I'm just being like honest. Like, if you want action, if you want a very interesting like turn page turner, um, Survivors was one where I think they really went out of their way to like show how you can actually start building society. I um, think building after the collapse. That's so one second great. after is actually, action scenes. <laughs> I mean, they it it really is the whole book, and that's one of the things I don't like about reading. So like, even if you looked at like Ayn Rand, like the strike, like it took the entire book just for like, okay, we gave up on everyone. Like, Atlas shrugged, and I was like, no, we all saw that, but we want to start there. We want to start where, you know, the uh, engine stops working and everything goes to shit. Like, I was expecting to see some riots in this last Anne Rand, like, series, like the trilogy of Atlas Shrugged, and it was just like, no, like, the rich people left, and they gave the people enough to get whatever they needed to do, um, but... <laughs> riots weren't in the movie's budget. <laughs> it, it, I mean... I just wanted, I mean, if, if I could, I would spend the rest of my life studying riots from a sociological academic perspective. <laughs> like, so, like, that's the kind of literature I want. I want to explore the breaking of the social, like, fabric. I want, like, if there is this social construct, let's see what's actually there to, or this social contract, let's see what is behind it, like, if, if it fails. So, and, in, in your mean, imagination, people are just, like, tearing off their ties and running wild. I actually think they'll yes. be putting on ties. That makes me very unhappy. Others. <laughs> I'd be very unhappy in this world. <laughs> well, no, no, again, like, the, it would be a free market solution. So, again, like, the Hobbesian myth is that people would go around killing each other just because, hey, there's no rules. Yeah, yeah. But if right. you actually look at DROs working under a polycentric legal system, and this moves into the segue of uh, Kalamale's talk tonight. Um, it's oh. like 10 minutes on um, privatized policing. Um, I had to work that in. But, yeah, the dudes with the ties... Um, are going to be looking out for you for once instead of looking for ways to exploit <laughs> people who are outside. Wait, wait, you can't, you can't come down on Frank like that. He's looking out for you. I I'm just <laughs> saying that there are some people who wear ties that are way more damaging than people who wear badges. Uh, wait, I'm trying... <laughs> that reminds me of wh when you were talking about studying riots. There's a book by Gustav... Le, I want to say Le Bon or something to that effect 
where it's called like the study of the crowd, and I think that I think it's from the 1800s, so it's probably free for Kindle. But I think he's, I think he might be the first person to have tried to study, uh, ma like mob rule and mob, you know, when mobs go and do something. So you is might it, want to start with that one. I'm trying to remember the title. Is have I got the right book? That it's like something, 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 and the madness of crowds. Yeah, probably. It's really? Gustav. I know it's Gustav, and then it's Laban or Labam or La, La something. That's the best title I've ever seen. <laughs> That's not a real title. <laughs> well, it's a real title. Uh, I am taking that title. Nobody else can use that title. Yeah, that'll be your next. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, titles, um, it's titles are not titles are not intellectual property. Yeah, it's it's a really good lead, I think. You know, people are gonna be sit back and be like, something, something. I wonder what the something is. You know, I mean, I'm more intrigued about the three somethings than I am about <laughs> the numbers of crowds. And I'll write Goldilocks and the three somethings, and then we'll see who gets more book sales. <laughs> That's right. Here, it reminds me of that thing. Competition. Um, it reminds me of that moment in the Princess Bride where where Vicini is saying move, they're on the boat and he's and he knows of course nothing about sailing and he's saying move the thing and the other thing and the other thing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. The something, something, something. Hmm. Yeah, I think he could go on your cover. You could have a Princess Bride scene on your on the cover of your book. Uh, I could have whatever I wanted to on the cover of my book. <laughs> It wouldn't even have to be any with relevant to whatever I'm saying. <laughs> yeah, as long as you, you know, you should probably say it has something to do with Douglas Adams. Then, That's then people right. will read it. Yeah. Right. So right. what I was talking about was more like going to G20 events where people like to protest capitalism and big business, and then the anarcho-communists will actually start breaking windows and starting stuff. But it's not really a riot per se because it just like trashes Main Street and then Main Street just rebuilds itself. It's not really a sustained sociological collapse within the social order. Um, but no, like that's one of the things. Like I was talking to people within sociology, and they're like, "Well, we would never fund that project. It's unethical to actually be within the vicinity of a ride in the first place." So uh, then I have to make uh, yeah, it like yeah. more, more of like an alternative reporting thing, like Vice does. But I couldn't actually get academic backing to videotape a riot and then analyze the, uh, the criminal damage or whatever sociological you'll, impact you'll the riot had. You'll, you'll get funded. <laughs> I mean, it's a cool idea, though, and that's one of the things dude, I like to bring. You could I like probably get funding from the NSA for this. Yeah. Dude, you, you could, tripped me out you could when probably I probably get I funding visited. from Vice. Wow. <laughs> I, I mean, mean, email the Vice. I don't know okay. where the next riot is, right? And that's what they said. They were like, well, even if there isn't a riot, we can charge you criminally for inciting a riot just so you can do the study. Yeah. <laughs> well... <laughs> Yeah, I mean, you know, institutions are going to be pretty allergic to riots in general and any sort of disorder. Uh, so, so in doing your study, I mean, it's kind of if, if you're doing a study for in, institutional means, then it's kind of like you're working against yourself, right? You got to feed the beast again. Uh -huh. You got to pitch it to like Goldman Sachs and tell them it's in their best interest for them to understand how this happens, so that they can prevent it when everybody gets mad at them for manipulating markets. Just making money on it, Ma making money on whatever crazy shoes those riders like to wear. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But I, th but I think when you ask for the funding, you need to be wearing a tie, and then you'll, then you'll get it no matter what. <laughs> <laughs> it would be kind of. <laughs> It would be kind of a cool thing to see on like Kickstarter, right? Yep. <laughs> fund my riot, fund my instigation of this riot and the study. <laughs> I, I, I thought that would be that would just be really. That would that would probably be so crazy. It would work probably. That'd be yeah. one of those things where you would be like, "That's so insane! I'm going to give you money." Yeah. Well, you I'm, might have to for Kickstarter. You might, you might have to. Go ahead. Sorry. No, it's okay. I'm just saying I'd give someone who wants to start a riot some money. I'm not saying how much. Yeah, see? <laughs> <laughs> make it make it anonymous anonymous donation. And you know, I mean, worst comes to worst, it's it's performance art, right? You are. <laughs> yeah, exactly. In the way right? of my, right. free speech, my art, my artistic expression. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's it's that's called a flash mob. It's not a riot. It's just a right. destructive flash mob. Destructive. Yeah, it's a bunch of bunch of people showing up and spontaneously dancing. Yeah. With baseball bats and fire. <laughs> well, it's part of the dance. <laughs> <laughs> but um, Tyler. Oh, 
I think he's going over to the um, the other talk. It looks like it's, oh, it's, yeah. eight, it's 858. I, either that or he went to start a riot. <laughs> or Goldman Sachs has hired him instantaneously. All right. <laughs> yeah, okay. they overheard us via NSA channels. Yeah, someone watched it. They were like, great idea. <laughs> um, but I, I think that's a really interesting idea. I wonder if riots are really the place to look for for social conventions and 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 their sort of disruption. You know, I mean, that's the great thing about like Henry James or any of these these uh, authors who are writing all character and and you you basically read them and you're like, oh, they're covering up all the stuff that's actually important. And the way that they cover it up is that's like the really fascinating stuff. That's what's important to them. That's what's important to the society. So I wonder if riots are the right place to look. It's, it may not be when the thing is breaking down that's really the place to look. It may be the how people try to uphold and maintain them. It's like looking at the conservatives to figure out what's really important to the society. But anyway, that's just a that's just yeah, an idea. Or, I mean, you know, I have I have absolutely zero contact with Occupy Wall Street or anything like that. Um, I live in rural Canada, so it. it <laughs> We have we have a, a chicken day parade uh, once a year uh, in my town, but that's as close as we get to a riot. You and say chicken day. Occupy the cornfields. Yeah, chicken a uh, chicken day. It's chicken. Oh, day. it sounded like you said chicken gay parade. No, I was very confused. <laughs> what you know, was. I would support that too. <laughs> the chicken day parade, but uh, it's like uh, quote unquote rioting or demonstrations have their own uh, set of etiquette, like this their own set of required norms, uh, dress that one is supposed to have, the placards that are appropriate and inappropriate. And so you might even you might even enjoy uh, looking at the social conventions there. Like, if you show up uh, to an Occupy Wall Street demonstration in a tie, uh, do people get along with you, or do they assume you're working for the man? Yeah. What about, like, the leader, the leader of the anarchy riot? You know, that would be a contradiction <laughs> if people yeah. wanted to, you know, a bunch of anarchists show up and then all of a sudden they have a leader, you know, telling them, let's go over here, let's go over there, etc. Well, yeah, if, he's, if, he's, if he's a unanimous, unanimously selected leader. Yeah, you know, unanimously right. and voluntarily. <laughs> <laughs> well, I guess, yeah. Wow. Uh, guys, i got to go pretty soon. Uh, it's been great talking to you all. Even Tyler, who uh, left us uh, to go work for Golden, Golden Sachs. <laughs> <laughs> we don't know that for sure. He might, he, might be the, he might be the NSA plant that we were imagining, right? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Suspicious behavior. That's right. Um, yeah, it, it has been fun. And uh, I guess we'll talk next week. I'll try to bring some more stuff to read because hey. I kind of I kind of like that. Does anybody object to that? Is it annoying having somebody read to you? And no, I like it. I think you should put bookmarks in your things before you bring them. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, definitely. So I can find them faster, or maybe I can actually. You know, the quotes are pretty short, and we're not. There's no. Uh, there's no digital. There's no DRM requirement, so maybe I can just like put them in in the book. Hang out or something like that, so you can actually see them before they show up. Thank you. Whoa, classy! <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> All right, okay, sounds good. good. Anyway, thanks. <laughs>